traditions of the Br'er Rabbit story kind of mashed into one, along with some Ghanaian storytelling techniques. So uh, I'm really excited to hear her version, and uh, this composer, Jonathan Woody, has written the music that will sort of wind in and out of that story. Um, and at the bottom you'll see Dominic Jardina, who's a historical clarinet player. Uh, you'll find out why we have clarinet shortly. I'll be telling you a little bit about um, some of the bands associated with Monticello. Um, Dominic works at Colonial Williamsburg, so he spends all day every day reinterpreting the past for folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, this gentleman, Lauren Ludwig, is um, a wonderful viola de gamba player and is bringing his special collection of what he calls Yankee Vials. And if you have no idea what that is, you can join the club. I'm probably the only person in this room who knows what that is, and I will, I promise, I'll tell you by the end of this talk. Um, so really excited for that concert, and um, this, this talk provides a lot of context for that concert, but it also stands alone, and you'll hear a lot of the music from the concert played by me on the ukulele. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna jump right in. When he, with his violin, Graham Bell with his clarinet and Wamba with the bass viol cut loose. There was only one thing to do, and that was dance. When they struck up Money Musk or Weston Slaughterhouse, he was a chump indeed who could sit by and look on without flinching onto the pretty girl and joining the merry throng. <laughs> so, this is a quote from an 1887 article in the Chillicothe Leader that describes the heyday of a band led by Heston Hemmings the once enslaved son of Sally Hemmings and this guy. <laughs> um, born in 1808, Eston bore a striking resemblance to his father. Jefferson, of course, never acknowledged fathering children with Sally Hemmings, but the resemblance caused a great deal of public and private speculation. And of course, today, the DNA evidence is quite conclusive. Um, Beverly Hemmings, Eston's oldest brother, was born in 1798. According to Jefferson's granddaughter, Virginia Randolph, Beverly played for the dances arranged by her father, oh, sorry, arranged by her and her friends at Monticello. Here's another great quote. <laughs> On Saturday next, the youngsters of Monticello intend to adjourn to the South Pavilion and dance after Beverly's music. Mama thinks we had better invite Mr. Stack, as he is, we hear, passionately fond of dance. <laughs> In his published recollections, Isaac Jefferson, an enslaved blacksmith at Monticello, claims that Sally Hemings' middle son, Madison, was also a fiddler, though Madison makes no such claim in his own recollections. So potentially here we have three sons, all three are fiddlers. Um, I, I personally like to think of three sons, three fiddlers. The Madison thing is a little questionable um, and depends on which scholar you talk to. Um, we all have different opinions about it, but it's um, if two of them were fiddlers, there's no reason to believe that three of them weren't. Um, and it's really no surprise at all that sons of Thomas Jefferson would be skillful fiddlers. Thomas Jefferson was an accomplished violinist himself. He reportedly practiced several hours a day as a young man and was a voracious collector of fashionable European compositions, everything from Corelli sonatas to Scottish folk tune arrangements. So um, I had the privilege of being a fellow at the International Center for Jefferson mm -hmm. Studies at Monticello and getting to leaf through this music. Um, Jefferson's collection is massive and all of it, almost all of it, is at UVA Special Collections. The rest of it is um, filed away in a room inside Monticello, actually. <laughs> um, I've gotten a chance to see all of it. It's really, it's magnificent. It's a um, it's a challenge to go through. All, all of the pages are very, very brittle, um, but luckily they also have it on microfilm, so I was able to also zoom through it a little bit. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite uh, an inspiration to sort of see music history um, in person. Now, Jefferson's wife and daughters were also accomplished amateur keyboard and guitar players, and his brother Randolph was known to play his fiddle on Mulberry Row, which was home to some of Monticello's enslaved residents. So I want to start by playing for you a piece called La Cabra. This is a Scottish folk tune. This is uh, one of Thomas Jefferson's favorite tunes. I hope you like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And it's become one of my favorite tunes. I've been playing it for a few years now, and um, it's really quite special. Uh, I will admit to you that this is not the version in the Monticello Music Collection. There are actually two versions. One is for keyboard, the other is for voice. This is a wonderful arrangement for violin by William McGibbon. Eston Hemmings lived, 
On the left is where S. and Hemings worked, his woodshop with his brother-in-law. And um, what I have found really poignant about this place is its connection to history. So we have Eston Hemings, who lived here in the um, 1830s, 1820s, yeah, 1830s, and um, would have faced a great deal of challenge being a free black man at that time in downtown Charlottesville. And then we've got Timberlake's Drugstore, which has been there since the 1920s. And I don't know the exact history of that place, but I can tell you that for certain, there was a period of time in which black patrons were not allowed in the door, and probably a period of time of segregation in that establishment. And then um, something that really struck me the first time I kind of walked around to each of these locations that I'm gonna tell you about, I stopped right there in front of Timberlake's and I looked down the street and I realized that I was on what is now called Heather Higher Way. Mm -hmm. This is the place where Heather Higher lost her life during the Unite the Right um, riot. And so there's this resonance that goes, that stretches back to Eston Hemings all the way to the present day. Um, I got some serious goosebumps uh, in that moment and um, it's, it is, it's really a, um, a, a, a strange place to stand <laughs> and, and know all those things. Do you know if there are any pictures of Reverend Sue's children? There are. Because, you know, they talk about how he, he looks so much like Thomas Jefferson, and I can't remember I, I, whether I'm off a generation or, or not. He would have been only one quarter black or one eighth black. So we're yeah. not talking, when you talk about him living there as a free black, some of Jefferson's children moved to the Midwest before yes. Jefferson died. And didn't want to have any paperwork. Yeah. Associated with their freedom because they can't ask for one. Yeah. You, you're uh, you're slightly ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> Stole my phone. <laughs> it's fine. Um, all right. This next slide. Um, so this is the new new ish um, memorial to the enslaved laborers that is next to the rotunda at the University of Virginia. And again, walking through there, I was really struck by finding this name on the wall. I didn't know in advance that it was gonna be there, Eston Hemings. And my understanding is that he is, his name is etched there because he built a violin case for the University of Virginia. Um, he was a carpenter in addition to being a violinist. That's a correlation I see quite a bit when I look at enslaved violinists. They were often also carpenters. I wonder if some of them built their own violins. I'm sure that's probably the case. Um, but at any rate, um, this is a beautiful memorial and, a, um, and very cool to see Eston Hemings' name etched there. There's at least one other fiddler on the wall. It's an anonymous fiddler. It just says fiddler. Um, and I've seen a couple of other names that look to me to be the names of fiddlers. They are names that I that I know are fiddlers, but they, they're also sort of common names, so they could be someone else. Um, I'm still trying to unravel that one. Um, but I also wanted to show you this. So this is also on the, the downtown mall in Charlottesville, or what we now know of as the downtown mall in Charlottesville. The picture on the right is what's now Wells Fargo Bank. That building has been sitting there for about 100 years. Um, and has, has been a bank of some description that entire time. I'm sure it's changed names at least 10 times. But the picture on the left is what used to be there. And this is the Scott family home. So uh, this is Jesse Scott that I was telling you about early, earlier and his sons and, and grandson, which I'm gonna tell you about in a moment. Um, Robert, uh, we, we'll learn about Robert Scott Sr. in a moment, but if you look really carefully, you can see Robert Scott Sr. in that photograph. This is Jesse Scott. <laughs> I, I love this portrait. So um, I had the opportunity to actually see this portrait in person. The owner brought it um, to me in Charlottesville and showed it to me. And um, Jesse's character really shines through, even here, but even more so when you get to see it in person. It really, his, his smile pops out in a way you, you actually can't see for sure that he's smiling in this picture, but he definitely is in the, in the real painting. Um, so 
I, I do want to be clear here, because I'm mostly talking about black fiddlers, but Jesse Scott was not actually black. He was Pamunkey Indian um, through his mother, Anika Kumba, and um, his father was a white man, uh, Charles Scott, who would go on to become governor of Kentucky. Or at least that is the lore. I have to say that the, the dates are a little wonky on that, <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I've seen it in many, many sources, and it's certainly passed down in the family that that is the case. Um, so he apparently inherited his love for music from his mother, who had a beautiful singing voice, and he began playing the violin at a young age. So Jesse and Sally Jefferson Bell, that's the connection here to the Hammonds family, um, had three sons, all of whom were taught to play various instruments by their parents, including violin and flute. So Jesse was a violinist. Um, his wife was actually a pianist. Their three sons all played fiddle and flute for sure, um, and I've seen uh, indications of some other instruments in the family as well. Um, we have some really vivid descriptions of the family from Philena Carkin, who was a white teacher from Boston who taught three black children in Charlottesville. So um, here's what she has to say about Robert Scott Sr., who's seen in this portrait here. He had a very fair education, picked up I cannot tell how, was well read and could converse ably upon all the important subjects of the day, whether it was the reconstruction of the Confederate States, the Darwinian theory of the descent of man or woman's suffrage. In her Southern Sketches of 1888, Laura Langhorne remarked on Robert's relative wealth, noting the dark mahogany sideboard, fine china, cabinet organ, and sewing machine in the home, as well as a Franklin stove Jefferson once used at Monticello. Oh yeah, this was actually um, the first time I gave this talk was um, at Monticello, <laughs> and um, the the person who is the curator of the interior of Monticello gasped when I said that she had not heard that story before. <laughs> um, so I'll now tell you a little bit about middle son Thomas Scott. I don't have a portrait of him, but we know that he accompanied William C. Reeves and Edward Livingston, who were the successive. U.S. Uh, ministers to France as their valet. Oh. He apparently remained in France, married and died there, losing touch with his American family. So this is a very different choice than the one Sally Emmons made, who came back from Paris with Thomas Jefferson. Um, now Thomas Scott was never enslaved, but he did make a choice to leave his family behind and have a life of much greater freedom in Paris. Uh, and I actually don't know anything about his life in France. I guess I'm going to have to go to Paris. <laughs> um, then we have this wonderful description of youngest brother James Scott. More reserved in his manner than his brother, perhaps not as well educated, and much less confident in conversation, but a very pleasant man to me. Um, I have a portrait that I'll show you, or not a portrait, but I have um, a photograph of um, some of the Scots that I'll show you later. And I think you may be able to see, especially on this HD TV, you might actually be able to really see clearly um, the character of James. He's a little hunched over and looks like he's kind of apologizing for being in the photograph. Um, so, uh, from an 1874 article in the Charlottesville Chronicle, we learn that the three Scott brothers had a large number of children and grandchildren, quote, some of whom are being trained up in the way they should go, handling the bow with great facility, and giving assurance of a successful walk in the way their fathers trod. <laughs> now, I was very tantalized by this quote and really thought I was gonna find two more generations of Scott family fiddlers in great numbers. Um, so far, only one has emerged, but it's a great story. So this is Robert Scott Jr., obviously Robert Scott Sr.'s uh, son, uh, who often played in the family band as violins or cellos. There we go. Um, so Robert Scott Jr. was often known as Buck or Buddy to his friends. He taught at the Jefferson School in Charlottesville. This was the first black school in Charlottesville. And um, he was sent to Boston to finish his education so that he would be able to teach there. And as far as I can tell, he was either the first or one of the first black school teachers in Charlottesville. Um, he directed school performances and was known to offer his services as a musician for school functions along with his father and uncle James. Um, let's see. 
Uh, I wanted to show you this gravesite. So this is Maplewood Cemetery in Charlottesville. Um, so the uh, the grave on the um, left here is Robert Scott Jr., who actually died before his father, um, and um, and got the bigger <laughs> uh, grave. <laughs> um, and father, father Robert Scott is right here. There are three other members of the Scott family um, memorialized on this stone. And um, what's really remarkable about this is that Maplewood Cemetery primarily is a white cemetery. And these are pretty um, uh, fancy, a pretty fancy gravesite um, for this particular cemetery. And I, I find that really wonderful and remarkable that they're memorialized there. Um, I often do tours of downtown Charlottesville based on my research, and we start at this site and I play a few tunes um, at the gravesite. So um, I've been really fascinated with trying to recreate the sound of these um, fiddlers. And um, something I haven't mentioned yet is that I'm, I'm playing on historically informed equipment. <laughs> so um, this violin has strings that are made of sheep gut. Yeah. yeah, and that is why you saw me obsessively tuning my violin for the last half an hour before the show. Um, the strings, especially on humid days, will go out of tune over and over and over and over again. I will continue tuning this violin so that you don't have to hear me play out of tune. Um, but anyway, these sheep gut strings make a very different sound than what you might be used to on a, a modern violin. It's a more sort of resonant sound, um, and but not as loud. And that's that that's where the innovation came. As concert halls got bigger, um, folks wanted louder strings, and so the materials changed. I'm also using a bow from the era of these fiddlers, which is, in sort of classical terms, Mozart and Beethoven time period. This looks an awful lot like the bow you're used to seeing on a violin. The, the Baroque bow, I can actually show you one, looks real different. <laughs> Much shorter, curved in the opposite direction. Right? So um, often I'm playing 17th or 18th century music with a bow like that. This is 19th century music. The bow isn't fully evolved yet. There are still a couple of improvements to be made. Um, but actually, a bow like this is brilliant for this music. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, you wouldn't know this, but I can tell immediately that this is not a modern bow because it's lighter. Um, and you might notice I'm holding it way up here, whereas if you look at a modern violinist, they're going to be holding it down here. The balance point for this bow is right here. It just so happens that if you see any modern fiddler today, they're probably also holding their bow right here. It's the sort of the official fiddler's bow hold. Uh, so it works really well. and. Um, for me, it goes well beyond just playing the instruments of the time, which the materials do help a great deal. It helps you get into the sound world um, quicker. But there are also just stylistic concerns that come from, um, if you're thinking about classical music of this period, the information comes from like treatises. <laughs> so you read about um, what uh, Mozart's father said about music in his treatise on how to play the violin. Um, every every early violinist like myself has to read the, the Leopold Mozart treatise, treatise, so we learn about all of that. In this case, when I'm dealing with fiddlers and an oral tradition, um, it's, it's about piecing together breadcrumbs to figure out what this music might have sounded like. Um, so, the first thing <coughs> that we know is the instrumentation of the bands associated uh, with Monticello. Um, so, I mentioned Eston Hemmings earlier. So Eston started out enslaved at Monticello. He ended up in Chillicothe, Ohio, uh, after he gained his freedom and after he had been in downtown Charlottesville for a while. Um, so starting in about 1837 through 1851, he had this band, the Eston Hemmings Band, in Chillicothe, Ohio, and it was made up of violin, 
clarinet and an instrument called the bass viola. Um, now, I've just introduced you to what the violin of the Eston Hemings era was like. The clarinet was also quite different. The, today's clarinet is um, a lot of metal, right, with a lot of keys. There were many fewer keys on the classical era clarinet. Um, the interior was also slightly different, and it has a, a mellower sound, um, a little less nasal, and, um, and just a simpler system for playing. And, uh, and then there's the bass viola that I mentioned. Who here is familiar with the instrument viola da gamba? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I want to, even though that nobody's familiar, maybe it's not even worth talking about if no one's familiar with the viola da gamba, but um, typically, if you saw the words bass viola, that is what you would think of. You would think of this very ornate six string instrument. In fact, actually, if you see your brochure, that picture of Warren, he's holding a viola da gamba in that picture. So it has frets, it has six strings, it's quite ornate, has a very different sound than the cello, which is the instrument that I'm sure all of you are picturing right now. The bass viola that I'm talking about is more like a cello. It's like a cello that took some steroids. <laughs> it's like a fat cello, basically. Um, and uh, this instrument was very popular in America. Um, one name for it was the Yankee viol, and it was often used in sacred settings um, where, it, where an instrument was allowed. There are many instances in which instruments were not allowed, but this was sort of a compromise <laughs> where, you know, it wasn't the organ that was being played, but at least someone was holding down the bass notes and keeping people in time and in tune. Um, so this Yankee bass or Yankee viol became um, very popular in America, more so than the cello, actually. And so often these bands would have a Yankee viol or a bass viol in them. Um, and there are also just cases where people call the thing a bass viol and it was actually a cello. <laughs> um, the, there are many such confusions throughout the history of bowed bass instruments. Um, so what's remarkable to me is the legacy of the Eston Hemmings band. So a hundred years after Eston set foot in Chillicothe, newspaper columnist E.S. Winnis wrote about him in the Chillicothe Gazette. And um, he traced the lineage of string bands with similar instrumentations. So there was a Frenchman named Pujari who succeeded Hemmings, followed by a black musician, Umbel, um, excuse me, Umbel Jim West, and then the Hunter Boys, a family band well known throughout the region. So this family band consisted of two fiddles, bass viol, clarinet, and cornet. And if you think about that, we're starting to head in the direction of jazz, right? Or dance bands. Um, and then, Back in Virginia, we're thinking about the Scots again. Um, their band was typically just three fiddle players. Now this is very unusual for the time, as far as I can tell. I have read and read and read about configurations of bands from the time. Um, truly, one of the most common configurations was configurations was just a single fiddle player playing for a dance, right? Um, but often, the later you get, you get um, fiddle and banjo, or fiddle and cello, or um, some, or fiddle and clarinet, for instance, right? Some combination of um, unlike instruments. <laughs> to have three trebles, three fiddles, going at once um, is a remarkable sound, and one that I cannot wait to recreate on the 16th. Um, I haven't actually tried it yet. <laughs> Hope it works. Um, <laughs> And um, what's nice is we have a little bit of uh, evidence of the, the instruments that the Scots played, because we have, for instance, the picture or the portrait of Jesse Scott. You see him holding a bow very much like this. So we know that he wasn't playing one of these, which was possible in the early days of Jesse Scott's violin career. Um, bows like this would have still been around to some extent. Um, and then in a, a picture I'll show you later, you can see that um, uh, Robert Scott Jr. is playing what is very clearly a cello. Um, so
So, let me move to our next slide here. Um, so the Eston Hemmings Band, you've jumped back to Chillicothe, Ohio. <laughs> um, they played for the dances and balls in Chillicothe, Circleville, Lancaster, Portsmouth, and Columbus, Ohio. And there are two songs that we know for sure that they played. One is Money Musk, and the other is Wesley Slaughterhouse. So what's really interesting about Money Musk is that this version right here is actually from Jefferson's collection, and it's in Thomas Jefferson's hand. <laughs> now, that does not mean Thomas Jefferson wrote Money Musk. It's just a very popular fiddle tune. Um, but it is remarkable. This is a version of Money Musk that's a little bit um, out of the ordinary. Um, and I would have to imagine that this is sort of the version that was floating around Monticello. It's the version that Essen Hemmings picked up orally and brought to um, Chillicothe, Ohio. So when, when this, uh, we have this uh, Chillicothe leader quote saying that Essen Hemmings played Money Musk, probably sounds a lot, a lot like that. And I'm about to play it for you so you get to hear it. But first, I just want to say a word about Wesson's Slaughterhouse. Um, I have not been able to find a piece called Wesson's Slaughterhouse anywhere. I've asked lots of fiddle players. I've scoured the internet, <laughs> tune archives, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the best I can come up with is that there is a Playford tune, which is an English volume of dances called Slaughterhouse, probably approximately the same tune. So when you come, if you come on the 16th to our concert, you will hear us play Slaughterhouse without the rest of it. <laughs> uh, but here is Money Musk as, uh, as Thomas Jefferson wrote it down. First of all, um, a tune or a, a type of tune that we see everywhere is the Virginia Reel. Now, um, to be clear, the Virginia Reel is not a tune. It is a dance or a set of dance steps, right? And it can be danced to almost any reel. But my understanding is that Lord MacDonald's reel at the time was a very popular reel to dance the Virginia Reel to. Reel to and it's um, a tune that was in Jefferson's collection. So um, I'm going to play for you Lord MacDonald's reel in a moment so you get a sense of that. But um, let me also just speak about a few other things. There's a piece called Roger of Coverley, which is sort of like the European forerunner or European aunt <laughs> of uh, the Virginia reel. And then there um, is Home Sweet Home, which is a tune that's found in the Monticello collection that was popular for many years. Some of you will probably recognize that tune when I play it in a moment. Um, and the Hunter Boys also were known for playing waltzes, Varsoviana, 
uh, Rosella and uh, various other types of dances. And they charmed audiences with My Pretty Red Rose, the most popular song of the day. Now, pay close attention to the map here. They would start playing at 8 p.m., take a break at midnight, <laughs> keep going until 4 a.m. <laughs> In that time, they would play about 24 dances. So I did a little bit of, you know, back of the napkin math on this. Um, these tunes would go on for 10 to 15 minutes. So that money bus that I played, you might have noticed if you were following the sheet music, I played it twice through with the beats, and it took 30 seconds, right? Imagine playing Money Musk for 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm gonna circle back to that thought at the end because that tells me a lot about how to perform these works. So that they're interesting for the players and the audience and the dancers. Um, all right, here is Lord McDonald's Reel. Visited Charlottesville in 1824, 
this is um, a, a piece of sheet music that was written in honor of Lafayette's visit. And um, there were many such pieces. Um, as he traveled from place to place, there were um, various pieces that were composed and played for him. And uh, this Lafayette's quick step is found in the Monticello Music Collection. And you want to know who the fiddler was when uh, Lafayette visited Charlottesville? Jesse. <laughs> no, it was Jesse Scott. <laughs> yeah. So I have a feeling that Jesse Scott knew this Lafayette's quick step and played it for Lafayette. Um, and then there is 
this place. This is the Cool Springs Barbecue Club in Charlottesville. If you know where the law school at UVA is, this is <laughs> that area. And um, if you can see the numbers on this photograph, people one, two, and three are the Scots. Um, <laughs> I can actually really see it on the screen. <laughs> so, yeah, so number one here is Robert Scott Jr. holding a cello. Next to him, number two here, this is the face of Robert Scott Sr., kind of towering above his son. Um, and actually, for the first time ever, I can see the fiddle, I think, in his hand. Thanks for your HD screen. <laughs> And then person number three, you can just barely make him out. He's quite short. He's a little bit hunched over. That is James. And he is holding, for sure, a fiddle right there. Um, now, what I find really remarkable about this photograph is that the Scots are standing shoulder to shoulder with the white elite of Charlottesville. And most of these men were Confederate soldiers. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and in contrast, we have black servants tending the barbecue pit, right, who have not been invited to pose in the same way for this photograph. So that gives you an indication of the status of the Scots in Charlottesville and throughout Virginia. Um, a couple of things I wanted to mention about the Scots to give you more of a sense of uh, their musical abilities. We know from when the house that they were living in was torn down, sheet music was found in the homes. That means that they were musically literate. <laughs> now, I have no doubt that they were also, and perhaps primarily, learning music by ear, but being musically literate at that time, really for anyone, was kind of a big deal. We also know that Jesse, this is the father of all these folks, was a composer of sorts. Now, I do not mean that he sat down with pen and paper and wrote concertos, but he did compose reels. One of those reels is called Birdwood Reel. I wish I could play that for you today, but it is lost forever. <laughs> um, I have asked every fiddler I can find if they know a Birdwood Reel, and none of them do. But we at least know the name of one piece, Birdwood Reel. Um, now, this is where things get really interesting in terms of repertoire when we talk about the Scots. Um, so we know that they played Ole Lang Syne. We know that they played this tune with a very funny name called Malbrook Stevat in Gare, but we know that tune as He's a Jolly Good Fellow. <laughs> um, but then, here's where things get strange. We know that they played the most popular European opera dances of the day, including Meyerbeer's, or uh, tunes from Meyerbeer's Robert Le Diable and Albert's La Muerte de Portici. So I'm going to um, play you a couple of these tunes. And um, this has been a real challenge to kind of conceptualize. Because if you think about the opera pit and how a violinist might play something in an opera pit, I'll, just, I'll give you a, an example here. So the, the tune I'm about to play for you, this is how it would sound in the opera pit. some of their fiddling tradition into these pieces. So here's how I have reinterpreted that same tune. Scots really have a level of sophistication 
about them, right? <laughs> and um, you know, there's no reason to believe that they couldn't play very sophisticated music. And I'm about to play for you a very hard piece of music that I know that they played. <laughs> and you'll hear, I, I made it as simple as I could make it, and it's still incredibly difficult and virtuosic. <laughs> so I have to believe they were incredibly talented musicians. But I also know, as someone who plays a lot of fiddle music, etc., it's it's quite difficult to kind of undo that uh, tradition if that if that's where you started from, right? If you started learning things by ear, and the person who taught you those things was using slides and playing multiple strings at once and playing, you know, in that more sort of informal way, that's going to be ingrained in the way you think about music. And so I've tried to approach these. <coughs> Right down the middle, <laughs> where I'm paying homage to the sophistication of these fiddlers, but also to the heritage of how they learned these tunes. So this is the Valse Infernal from that opera Robert the Diablo of Meyerbeer. Um, and I truly, I have made this as simple as I can make it, and it is still a piece of virtuoso writing. <laughs> Such music they made as the gods of Terpsichore will never hear again in this generation. Such music has caused the old chateau to rock and reel to the cadence of the tripping feet and made old hearts young again. Right? So that is not polite music making. <laughs> um, to be sure. Um, two more things, really one and a half more things. Um, I, I want us to remember, first of all, 
this idea that these tunes had to be repeated many times, right? Mm -hmm. The dance steps were happening over and over and over again. They're making these patterns on the floor. Um, as a musician who would have to play for those dances, you would not want to just play Money Musk 30 times in a row the same way over and over. So you would improvise, you would ornament, you would change the instrumentation, um, you would try all sorts of different things to keep it interesting as a player, just so that you were on your toes the whole time. And, um, you know, in addition, I'm sure the dancers and the listeners were also grateful to not hear Money Musk the same way as everyone, <laughs> right? <laughs> the other thing to remember is that um, a member of the band was usually the caller of the dance steps, mm -hmm. right? So in this case, um, we know that uh, Jesse Scott was a very accomplished caller of dances. And that takes some skill, and it also takes um, part of your focus <laughs> as a fiddler, right? You are speaking and playing at the same time. And I, though it's sort of a hard concept to grasp without doing it myself, I am not a caller of dances, I don't have time to learn to be a caller of dances. Um, there's still just like leaving space for that conceptually that I like to think about as I'm working on creating um, this sound world. And that is the idea behind this concert on the 16th. And it's one of the reasons that I have this assemblage of folks. Um, these are all folks who are experts in early American music. And we're really creating a laboratory for a couple of days. Um, I haven't decided how this music's going to sound ahead of us. We are, we are having discussions, possibly arguments, <laughs> about how this music is going to sound. I already know that we disagree about some things. I've already had conversations with some of them where we definitely are not on the same page, and I can't wait. I can't wait to get in a room and figure out what we're going to do. And um, one of the cool things for us is that we're going to be rehearsing in a place where we know the Scott family used to play. Yeah, so we're playing in, or we're rehearsing in Hotel C on the UVA grounds. This is where the Literary and Debate Society is. Um, if you're familiar with grounds, it's next to the Edgar Allan Poe dorm room. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to just be in that historic space, which hasn't really changed since the time that the Scots played in it, and um, experience just sort of the, the resonance of that space. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to provide some information for us just by being in that space. But at any rate, um, that's, that is my talk, but I am more than happy to take some questions and, um, and also happy to play another tune or two if you'd like. Yeah. Yes. Who was it, Jesse, who played Put Your Little Foot? So Put Your Little Foot would have been the Hunter Boys, which is a band that came after S. and Hemings in Chillicothe. I think they had a call, but if I could sing that tune, it's to the left walk and turn, to the right walk and turn, yep. to the left walk and turn. <laughs> That is, I mean, that's a really great example, right? Where the call, the calling of the dance is, is actually the lyrics of the tune. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, you know why the fiddling tradition went one way with the violin in the opera, another way with the, with the slides and multiple notes? Um, that's, um, I, could, I could give a semester-long course on that. <laughs> it, is, um, it is throughout history. Folk traditions and sort of more formal traditions have existed side by side and influenced each other. Um, I also play medieval music, as you heard in my introduction. Um, and even, even then, right, there, were, um, there was sort of a folky fiddling style, and then there was um, like uh, religious polyphony. Um, and those were different styles of playing, but often the same player doing the two different styles. Um, and that is, it, it has just always been, but always been like that. Like maybe a difference in the audience for the same piece and what they wanted, a difference, like you played by ear, maybe it's harder to pick out exactly what note you want, so you're hit to, you know, slide that. Yeah, I mean, these, these are things that sort of developed organically, that the, the sliding, you know, somebody didn't wake up one day and be like, 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, it's just like that felt good, and they did it, and it um, it sounded good, and it matched the dancing and, and so forth. Um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> um, any other questions? Don't be shy. I have some more. Sure. Um, <laughs> let me. Um, I'll tell you an, another story. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, let me pull this up. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Do you have any evidence that, that the Scott fiddlers and, and the Hemming fiddlers played at the same event together? Or? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the coolest thing ever. Um, I, I am very confident that they knew each other well and were learning from each other. Yeah. My suspicion is that Jesse Scott basically taught all of the fiddlers on that family oh, tree. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly. I don't know where he learned to play fiddle, but I I strongly believe that he was sort of the the elder statesman of the fiddle the fiddling tradition at Monticello and was was training up his relatives to to play. Um, we know that he taught his sons, but then if you think about um, you know Eston Hemmings just living right down the the street. <laughs> they, 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 there have to have been jam sessions <laughs> where all ten of them were sitting on the porch yeah. and playing together. And is there any evidence that Jefferson taught his children with Sally how to play? Um, there's definitely no evidence of that. It's, it's something he wouldn't have done because he wouldn't want to have let on that he oh, was the father. Okay. Um, but also, um, he had injured his wrist a couple of times. <laughs> um, was it both? He fell off a horse two different times, is that right? He fell off a horse here at Poplar Forest right. and injured his wrist the first time. And then the second time, maybe the more famous one, he was leaping over a fountain, I think, in Paris trying to impress Mariah Cosway. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there, were, um, there are a lot of years here where Jefferson actually isn't playing the violin. Okay. So, um, but Jefferson's brother definitely was playing fiddle and was, was playing on Mul Mulberry Road. There's definitely some cross-pollination going on there. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I'm kind of, I'm confused about the music exactly, whether it was something that we sit and listen to or they dance to. I mean, if Jefferson is going to show up, he's not going to want to hear something that he dance to. He's going to just want to listen to something he listens to. But we see a picture of these people here. Do you think that they're going to play a reel and they're going to dance around, or are they going to play something that we can just sit and listen to? I, th I think there are definitely two or three different contexts here. Mm -hmm. You know, we've definitely got the balls where they're dancing all night. So everything they play is accompanying dances. But I actually don't know about things like a barbecue. I don't know if they we're cutting a rug at the barbecue or not, right? I, I, I think they might have been, but I also suspect, I mean, so for sure when they're playing at um, the Mineral Springs, I think that is dinner entertainment. Um, and then, yeah, playing for Jefferson, certainly Jefferson by himself didn't just dance to their music. That would be ridiculous, <laughs> you know? Um, but I, you know, I suspect that the repertoire is pretty much the same. Um, I, I don't think that they had a dance band repertoire and a um, entertaining folks that were sitting around repertoire. Um, so I want to uh, close with one more sort of story and a couple of related minuets here. <laughs> so um, while I was doing my research. I was um, leafing through this enormous volume of minuets. There must have been 200 minuets in this volume. And as I was leafing through it, I went, wait a second, the page numbers did, weren't sequential. And I realized that Jefferson had stitched together like five books of minuets, which is kind of ridiculous, to be honest, to have just you know, minuet after minuet after minuet after minuet. Um, and they were all very sort of similar in style. And then I got to what should have been a blank page, and Jefferson had put in some stat lines and had written out the melody of a minuet. 
And I was like, well, this is interesting. I wonder if he was like just practicing copying out music. So I went, I looked through all 200 minuets to see if it was one of those, and it wasn't. So then I went through a bunch of different sort of tune archives, and it wasn't there. And I looked at my research partner, who was Warren Ludwig, who's in that picture playing viola da gamba, and I said, uh, did Thomas Jefferson write a minuet? <laughs> and we actually think so. We think that maybe he composed this minuet. Um, so what's interesting about it is, first of all, all of the minuets that are published in this volume, or these volumes, have um, a right hand and a left hand, like for piano, right? So there's a, there's a melody line and there's a bass line. Um, in other words, counterpoint. Um, Thomas Jefferson just wrote out a melody line. Um, and I, here's why I find this interesting. So there's a, a quote from uh, Jefferson, sorry. <laughs> You're not gonna like this part. <laughs> um, from the notes on the state of Virginia, where he is really very dismissive about black musical talent. He basically says, you know, they're, they're capable of a small catch, but counterpoint is not something that they're capable of. And here he is only able to write out a melody and he really kind of ripped off the melody of another minuet and then kind of took it in a different direction. So it really isn't all that impressive, but it's an interesting exercise to kind of see what he's done. Um, just to uh, keep on that theme of this quote from the notes in the state of Virginia, I also want to mention that five years after writing that, he was in Paris and heard Afro-European violinist George Bridgetower playing a Viotti concerto at age nine, <laughs> right? Really, really impressive playing. This is the same George Bridgetower that um, uh, was dedicated a sonata by um, Beethoven. Um, if you're familiar with the Kreitzer sonata of Beethoven, yeah. that was originally dedicated to Bridgetower. Um, and if you ask poet Rita Dove or you ask me, that should still be a dedication to Bridgetower. The two gentlemen had a disagreement. <laughs> And it was then uh, dedicated to Kreitzer, who had nothing to do with the composition of the piece at all. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, Bridgetower was a very impressive nine-year-old. And somehow this did not um, sink in to Jefferson that he had made a really major <laughs> uh, misjudgment of black musical talent. But let me play for you these two minuets. So I'm going to play for you one of the published minuets called Calvert's Minuet. And so I'll just play a few bars of it, actually, and you'll see kind of how it goes. And then I'm going to play what Jefferson wrote. And you're going to see the ways in which he kind of ripped off the other <laughs> <laughs> Here's another reason that I think there's a possibility that Jefferson wrote this. Um, Fitzhugh is the last name of someone Jefferson would have known pretty well. It's a family that he stayed with on his way to uh, our nation's capital. And um, this, the, the patriarch of that family uh, was a flute player. And this piece I'm about to play for you fits really nicely on the flute. <laughs> but I have a feeling he kind of wrote it to, as a you know, kind of a gift to his friend. So let me remind you that this is the beginning of Calvert again.
Thank you. This has been really fun. I really appreciate it. <laughs>